Okay, everybody. Our next speaker is Declan McCabe. He is a community ecologist specializing in the invertebrates of freshwater habitats, including springs, streams, and Lake Champlain. He has been part of the St. Michael's College faculty since 2001, teaching ecology, evolution, and general biology. His research and interests have included biomonitoring, sampling techniques, zebra mussel impacts, and null model analysis. Uh, Declan has an ongoing collaboration with Vermont EPSCoR funded investigators since 2008 and is actively involved with their high school outreach program called the Streams Project. His talk is Stream Macrovertebrate Responses to Landscape Variables and Evaluation of Rapid Bioassessment Techniques Using Statistical Modeling Approach. Thank you. Titan was almost as long as the Well. Uh, I'm part of the same group, um, the same rock group, we've been hearing about the EPSCoR group, and uh, I'm going to focus on some of the outreach work we're doing, and on a model that uh, Phil Yates has been working with. Phil is, in our, is a statistician in our math department at St. Mike's, so we've got lots of data to play with, and he's been good enough to help me. I never get to the acknowledgement site, so I put it in next, and uh, none of the work I'm talking about could be done without Caitlin, Alex, Tyler, Aaron, Bridget, Lexi, Hazelton, who did a lot of our, our the G, the GIS work on this. These guys are all students other than Lexi, and they've done a whole lot of bug picking over the years. So, on we go. Um, we've been doing this work since 2008. It started as a, as a cool summer project, and I've always liked bug stuff, and it was an opportunity to get back into it. We have more than 60 sites, stream sites, that we're working on, and um, we've been looking at just modeling watershed effects on invertebrate communities. It's the sort of the quick thumbnail of what we're doing. Today I'm going to focus on 53 sites on a modeling project that Phil has developed with the, the stats part. So here's what we do. We get out into the streams. One of my missions at St. Mike's is to get a whole bunch of students involved in research, as many as I can. And uh, invertebrates are a good way to do that. They're very, very accessible. And it's also very accessible to the high school groups. And at the same time, I want to get some meaningful data. So uh, we, do a, we do the same technique that the state of Vermont uh, has been doing. We take a kick net, we get four samples. Um, and then we train the interns and we identify them. And we use the standard keys that anybody else would use, but we also develop an, an iPhone app. So uh, if you'd like your stream to be in the iPhone app, send me a sample. Send me a picked sample of bugs. And, you know, we'll take the names, we'll put a little wiki together, and the iPhone app will pick it up. Go to the iPhone phone store, or whatever it's called, the iTunes store, search for Vermont Dev Score, and you'll find the app. And then you can bring it to your field site with photographs of all your bugs. Sound like a good time? I don't know. It makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so we've got the students involved in the research. Uh, we get our research questions answered. We get the interns trained. They go off and they present at different meetings. Which is very good for them, good for the resumes. And then we also support the high school teams. The app is what supports the high school teams and the wiki sites to facilitate their identification. So, um, here's the sites I'm talking about. They're all scattered around Vermont. Um, uh, this is the, the GIS layer that was used to generate the, uh, the data for, for the uh, landscape characteristics. Those of you who are involved in GIS will know what that means more than that. So uh, Lexi Hazelton did all of that work. But everybody asks me, where did you get your GIS data? So there's the title. If that's your question, there's the answer. Um, I end up treating it as simply a data source at the end. But uh, that's Lexi's work. And then the samples come from 2008 through, that, to, through 2010. So there we go. There, these are the parameters that were initially sorted through. And what I'd like you to see is some of these overlap. Um, you know, obviously some of these are just different units. We eliminate anything that's, you know, eliminate the British units, eliminate things that are essentially telling us the same thing. And then beyond that, we look for collinearity. Some things directly are collinear with each other and uh, mess up your ability to model anything. So certain things are limited. And when we were all said and done, this is what we had left for the model. So the size of the catchment, um, uh, the, the component of the landscape that is forest, agricultural component, distance to lakes, to dams, to bridges, culverts, all of these things came out of GIS tools. Okay, sinuosity, bedrock classifications. I have no idea which of these things might be most important for influencing the bugs, and that's what the modeling effort is about, determining which of these characteristics tells us something useful that can predict what, what insects will be there. All right? And then, in terms of measuring insect responses, that's easier because people have been doing this for a long time, and there's a whole lot of people who have a lot of experience and developed a wonderful set of metrics that you can use. 
So we keyed in on EPA's rapid bioassessment, um, rap, you know, the rapid bioassessment protocols, and took the uh, measures that they have been using for quite a long time, and decided to sort through those and see which ones are most valuable in the context of looking at landscape in Vermont. Okay, so. Um, the Vermont, Vermont EC has given us information in terms of tolerance and intolerance of organisms. Some organisms you will find in almost every stream, they're hard to kill. So those are the tolerant organisms. Others are very sensitive. There are stone flies, for example, that can only live in the genus of waters. Cool water, oxygenated water. So that's all defined by people like Steve Fisk. So there you go. <laughs> Perfect timing. Life is good. <laughs> See, he's right on cue. You've got to run that. So that's where that comes from. Um, other things like for, uh, what's a filter, filter, what's a grazer, a scraper, what's a clinger, that comes right out of the standard literature, Murray Cummins and Bird. Um, so the filtering organisms, it turns out, are found <coughs> very much to urban, uh, urban habitats, for example, and also agricultural. You get a whole bunch of filtering collecting caddis flies. So these are just um, functional gills. So, um, we put it all together and generate um, a principal component axis, a landscape axis, okay? I'm not going to spend long on that because I'm not going to talk there. But basically we can, we can get a landscape axis that generally runs between um, forest and urban. That's a sort of a, a quick uh, summary of what that axis means. All right. And then we array uh, the, the data on horizontal axis and we put the species on a vertical axis responding to that landscape axis, if that makes sense. And this is the part where Phil Yates comes in and does his magic. And it's all based on the binary distribution, looking at presence and absence of, of bugs. So, we have to predict what community should be there based on the landscape axis. And then we have standard metrics measured from what is there. So we have two axes now. We have what exists there, and what we predict would be there based on the <coughs> landscape characteristics and we can put regress one against, each, against the other. If the model is perfect, we get a beautiful 45 degree line up the middle, right? And that's a fantasy. So, here is reality, and this is actually the best one. I'd like to show you the best one. And this is, a, this is not bad. So I put the fake line in there. This is, this is perfection. This is where we'd like everything to be. The black line, the, black, the large black dots are where things actually are. And the small dots are the confidence limits of the prediction. Whenever I show this slide, people say, oh, hang on a second, how come the confidence in interval isn't as symmetrical about the observed? And it's because the confidence interval is developed from the predicted. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the predicted is on the horizontal axis, the observed is on the vertical, but I flipped the confidence intervals to show you where I would hope the dots would line up. And you can see that sometimes the dots line outside the confidence intervals, and sometimes they're close to it. So we have a decent uh, model with taxonomic richness. So this is just a number of taxa that we find. And remember, we're working with EPA's um, rapid bioassessment protocols. Some things are identified to species, because they're the only species that occur. But most things are identified to family or genus, right? So this is a taxonomic richness as distinct from the species richness. But we're still getting a pretty tidy response, and we're pretty happy with that. So that's the way the model generally gives you some output. And we have repeated that then to the 14 metrics that we can model, or that we could have modeled. It turns out someone we couldn't model, and then you get into that. So what responds best? The metrics that gave us the tightest fit were percentage filters. So this is that functional feeding group, the things that are filtering particles out of the water. They respond to landscape. And that's not surprising. Anything you mess with in the landscape causes some erosion potentially. You put a parking lot in, you increase water flow to the streams, you've got more erosion, you've got more particles. So it's not surprising that filtering collectors would respond to changes in the landscape. And the next one, Percenti Camaroptera. This is a group of organisms that includes some very sensitive, pollution sensitive, um, pollution gene tolerant organisms. So uh, looking at, at you know, Percenti Camaroptera is not, in Camaroptera, mayflies, is not surprising that they respond. The grazers, grazers are scraping algae and prey fighting from the rocks. They need a rock that is not coated in fine particles. So again, we're not surprised that they, they um, they respond. There's overlap between these two groups. Many of the things that graze, not surprisingly, are clinging onto the rock, right? There's some overlap there. Um, but the clingers, again, need a, a habitat that is not full of fine particles. So the particles, to me, are one of the major take-homes that I'm getting from these. But we haven't measured particles, so I can only <coughs> wave my arms a little bit about that. Um, 
when you look, when you narrow down the list of characteristics and, and ignore some of the things that are not actually land use, so if you ignore bedrock classification, for example, and look only at the things that are land use, um, uh, these are the two things that responded to land use. Percent EPT, so Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera. Stoneflies, uh, sorry, Mapeflies, Stoneflies, Caddisflies. Those are the, the group, those three groups aggregated together are sensitive. So they respond to changes and they are most commonly found in forested landscape. And Mapeflies the same logic. Agricultural land increased the percentage of filters, which I, can, I think I've kind of explained. It also increases the percentage of fingers. Um, I'm not exactly explaining that one, so uh, Steve might have a guess. <laughs> but there you go. Um, metrics we couldn't model, there's some things we just couldn't model. Uh, Plecoptera richness, the richness of just stoneflies, the richness of just caddisflies, and the number of intolerant taxa. We couldn't come up with a model that would model any of those. So my sort of knee-jerk interpretation of that is that these are, are less useful for um, modeling landscape Vermont's, you know, Vermont landscapes essentially. But they probably work in some other place. But they didn't work well in our context. They might work better if you had better taxonomic reasons, it's hard to say. Alright, so, um, how are we doing? <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll quickly, we basically ranked the most influential characteristics of the landscape now that impact the, the, the organisms. So you know what organisms respond to, now you know what factors cause them to respond. So, uh, size, of the, size of the watershed, okay? The agricultural component of the watershed, bedrock classification, site elevation, okay? So these are the, the ones that were most important, okay? And we did the, we did the ranking, sorry, this is the most important for mayflies. We ranked each of them for all of the things that responded, okay? And then we summed up the ranks to find out overall what was most important. So this is just showing you what was most important for mayflies. But now if we look at the sum of everything that responded, we can find out that these are the things that mattered most. Size of watershed and bedrock class were neck and neck. These are really important. Uh, agricultural import, uh, component was second, distance from the town was, was third, and you get the idea. Okay? So we can rank the characteristics that actually matter. Does that make sense? So there we are. Um, the next step, and this will be my last slide, is, uh, you know, one thing about a model like this, some people say you've shot a hole in the barn door, and then you've painted a target around the hole, and said, yay, go us, right? The next step is to shoot the target again and again and again. And we have six more streams that we will test and see how the model performs for six streams that were not part of creating the model. That's where we're heading. So it's a work in progress. So thank you all. We have not. We have not. But that will be something to do. So we need to look at landscapes now that have been invaded by your earthworms. They're not bad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was detecting an, an accent, you know. I thought we were all about to keep coming in. Like <laughs> 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 myself. Anyway, close neighbors. Any, any, uh, so yeah, that'd be a cool thing to do though. To find the, I, I assume we're increasing erosion because of the earthworms, am I right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And more actually, erosion and very more ground growth and then the forests. Yeah. It would be cool to find watersheds with them without good comparison. Yes, I'll find it. You don't put the ones away. Any other questions that we're all set? Thank you. We're gone. Thank you very much. Thank you.